My name is Peter Lilliadol. I'm a professor of mathematics education at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. And I'm the author of the recently released Corwin book, Building Thinking Math Classrooms. And I'm Judy Larson. Uh, I am an associate professor at the University of the Fraser Valley, where I teach math courses and teacher education courses. And I'm very fascinated and um, connected to the Thinking Classrooms framework. So last year at the virtual summit, Judy interviewed me about Thinking Classrooms. This year, we're going to turn the tables and I'm going to interview Judy about Thinking Classrooms. So um, I like to introduce Judy when, when we do workshops together and so on. I like to introduce Judy as the person on the planet who knows more about Thinking Classrooms than anybody other than myself. Um, but it wasn't always like that. So Judy, why don't you tell us what are what is thinking classrooms and what was your journey into thinking classrooms so the building thinking classrooms framework is a set of 14 practices that have emerged from observing classrooms and studying different aspects of breaking down the institutional norms that occur and you can read more about it in your in peter's book and on peter's website um, for myself my first introduction to it was a little bit of a shock. Um, it was in 2011, I was just starting grad school and um, I was not expecting to come into a room that was uh, disorganized and tables were all over the place and Peter wasn't even in, in the classroom. Uh, he walked in right when the uh, time started and told us to all get up and come over to the corner and showed us math trick a card trick and as a you know fresh grad student I was expecting to take good notes and sit and um, listen and soak things in I was not expecting to get up um, but after that initial shock I started implementing the three main uh, practices that, that uh, really are the foundation that a lot of people recognize the thinking classroom as which are using vertical whiteboards um, around the room and having random groups, visibly random groups, and uh, good problems to begin with good problems. So those were sort of the foundational things that I started with in my teaching. And I thought, okay, this is thinking classrooms and that's all there is. And it went well, like I was getting good feedback from my students and yeah, it was all fine and jolly. Until? Until. <laughs> And around tw uh, four or five years later, I, um, I was starting my PhD program and I was, I was curious to know more about your research in it and to understand more about it. And so I started attending uh, your workshops uh, for teachers and, you know, one after the other. Eventually, I think I came to more than 30 workshops and just sat in the back or sometimes I engaged with the participants as well. And... Um, I began to realize that it's not just those three practices, first of all. There's way more, and there's way more nuance um, to the framework. So some of the things that I noticed right away, the first one I attended was in North Vancouver, and you were introducing flow, and this idea of stringing together sort of a sequence of hints and extensions that would um, keep and manage uh, students in flow. And I really felt this as a participant in that, in that workshop. And I also then was able to reproduce it in, in my teaching. Um, some of the other things I started noticing was just how important working the room was um, and how the pace of that happened. Um, the way that you introduced the task and then you would really build that energy. First, you would wait in the center and watch everyone kind of organize and then you started really just like moving the energy around the room as you paced through each each group in different patterns so that was really fascinating because that was not really written about anywhere it was just something that i experienced and then i was able to kind of take into my own teaching okay so but those first three practices are part of the thinking classroom yeah. framework and if you if you've learned all 14 practices, you also learn that you can't implement all 14 of no. those at once. And that when you do begin implementing thinking classrooms, those three ones that you had learned about first are actually the first three practices that get implemented. 
in the classroom. And, and the idea of flow doesn't actually get implemented until well, much later. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, if you're implementing them in sequence, it's the ninth practice that gets implemented. If you're implementing in chunks, it, it lives inside the third chunk or the third toolkit, as it's so called. Uh, and as Judy mentioned, you can get more information on, for, about this in the book or on uh, the website buildingthinkingclassrooms.com. Um, okay, so Judy, you, you mentioned you, you did your master's with me. Your master's was out of flipped classrooms. Uh, then you came and did your PhD with me and you defended your PhD last November. So can you just tell us a little bit about what was your PhD about? Yeah, so it ended up being uh, focused on the community MITBOSS that is on Twitter. It's under hashtag MITBOSS, which stands for Math Twitter Blogosphere. And it is a collection of math teachers who communicate through Twitter online. Um, How'd you get interested in that topic? So I got interested in that topic because I was interested in professional learning as, as, as a broad sort of space. And then within that, moments of collaboration and moments where new ideas were generated. And that's really what I was chasing in this space was um, when are these new ideas generated? I was also really fascinated by this community in particular because when I started digging into uh, talking to the members and um, going to some of the sort of physical meetups that they would have, um, that there was a lot of discussion about how this is the best professional development ever. So Twitter is the best professional development ever, is what I heard time and time again. And so I was curious. I've, I've heard that too, yeah, and, I've, and I've read it on, on yeah. Twitter under the hashtag. Yeah. So I was really curious why, and if so, how. Um, yeah, so. Okay. So it was at this time you're spending endless yeah. hours mm -hmm. in going into the rabbit hole that is MitBoss yeah. and reading all of these tweets and so on and so forth, trying to understand how, how MitBoss is such a powerful professional learning community. Um, and at the same time, you're hanging out in all of these workshops on Thinking Classrooms, 30, I think it was, and you're also implementing Thinking Classroom in your own teaching at the university. And I think you were also starting to bring some uh, pre-service teachers into mm -hmm. Thinking Classrooms. And you were also visiting th some Thinking mm -hmm. Classrooms with me. Um, so what do these seemingly very different context have in common. So you've got MitBoss, which is an entirely asynchronous online community, mm -hmm. um, or at least what's happening that you're studying is asynchronous mm -hmm. and online. And contrast to the, these face-to-face -face, uh, thinking classroom environments that you're spending time in. So what do these communities have in common? So I'd say it comes down to negotiation or opportunities for negotiation and collaboration and generativity and synergy like the energy of coming together around sort of a common goal um, but there's also a decentralization of, of there's no sort of central authority that dictates what um, anyone is to do it's all sort of emergent and can, okay I can see that in MitBoss but the thinking classroom has a teacher in it. The yes. teacher is a central authority. Exactly, but it aims to decentralize the authority of the teacher. Like the way I see it, everything you're doing is you're trying to, you know, not be at the front of the room and not be, you're becoming part of the context of the space. It's almost like, so in Twitter, somebody set the constraints of what is possible, the range of possibility in okay. Twitter. Somebody said, you know, you can retweet, you can reply, you can do these things, but it's, there's a limitation on that. Um, whereas in a thinking classroom, you're part of the context and you're setting those constraints. There's also density that's different. So it's almost like the density in Twitter. There's so many people on Twitter that someone is bound to sort of take that lead role on, but mm -hmm. it's always a different person. Whereas in a thinking classroom, you are the sort of central um, organizer but you're not in the center you're kind of okay. pushing it from the back right so this is so i just want to add a little bit of context to this so 
so Judy is the one who gave me this vocabulary of decentralized control in a thinking classroom, which is not something that emerged explicitly. So the thinking classroom research was about trying to find practices that, that generate thinking, that get students thinking, and so on and so forth. And never along the way did I do research on centralized or decentralized control. But if, if you start to think about um, what's happening in a thinking classroom, of course the teacher's setting the task and the teacher's setting the pace and the teacher's deciding when they're going to consolidate. But also there are things, external constraints, like the bell is going to ring at a certain time mm -hmm. and the school has provided the classroom with teacher with a, a space to do this work in and so forth. So there are these external controls, but inside of this, there's a huge amount of decentralizing of control mm -hmm. and 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 putting more and more responsibility on the learner. Yeah, so I mean, how you answer questions, you're just sort of passing on that control as you as you do it, right? You're trying to bounce off the thinking and mm. have it go back into the learning space. You also have just the way you're acting in the room. I think, I mean, you found uh, results around the different organizational structures in the room of where the teacher is, how organized the space is, the more, um, sort of messy, the, the more thinking happened. Yeah. Um, so these sorts of nuanced things that the teacher does actually set the constraints for uh, a strong sort of uh, student-focused community to emerge. And we spoke a lot about that last mm -hmm. year. And incidentally, if you want to listen to that recording from last year, you can go to buildingthinkingclassrooms.com slash podcast, and you'll find that recording there. Okay, so let's get back to this, because this, this was one of the things that when I was living in this space with you was incredibly fascinating for me, because although I was leading the Thinking Classroom workshops and you were the, the sort of fly on the wall, we spent a lot of time unpacking those sessions. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you were the one who was leading the research into MITBOSS, but I, as your supervisor, we spent a lot of time unpacking mm -hmm. that space. And one of the things that we found was Although these spaces are seemingly different contextually, there it turns out to be a lot of similarities between them. And, and this was in, tremendously helpful to me because thinking classrooms was what I call results first research. And what that means is that I was looking for what I call optimal practices. These are the, the things teachers can do that are most effective at generating student thinking. And these were organized around 14 questions, so to speak. And for example, uh, early on in the research, we found that students were most productive and, and did more thinking and more students thought when we had the students work on vertical whiteboards or vertical non-permanent surfaces, we called them. And that was a result that emerged very clearly. But there was no explanation for why that was the case. We had the result long before we had the explanation. And, and I was at that time when you were spending all this time in, in these workshops, I was still busy trying to find explanations for some of these results. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what were some of the things that you learned in MitBoss on Twitter mm -hmm that helped us explain what was happening in Thinking Classroom and vice versa. What were some of the things that you were thinking or seeing in Thinking Classrooms that was helping you explain what you were seeing in MitBoss? Yeah, so the thing about the vertical non-permanent surfaces is that it kind of allows for this reification or like a trace to be made on the whiteboard in sort of a local comfortable space for students um, but it's just you know it's there for others to see and so that's one thing I think even from feedback from my students I've had is what they value about is they can see all the different ways other students are working and in, in a sense that happens on Twitter you have these sort of tweets that are floating around that you randomly um, interact with or find or, and then choose to reply or retweet um, and act with either passively or actively. And so something that happened early on when I came to one of your classes was we were doing a, a problem, I think it was the, the moat mm -hmm. and the, the 
the two pieces of wood yeah. you have to get across the moat, but none, n neither piece of wood is long enough to reach yeah. across the moat. Exactly. And so students were working on it and drawing it out. And there was just sort of a stall for a little while. Everyone was just staring at their little moat picture and thinking about their pieces of wood. And at one point, we were both standing there in the center. And within a flash of a second, the, the solution just traveled across the room as if it just the room knew. Um, and so it really just started in one place and, you know, people would look over and, and see it. And then because it was such a visual solution, unless you see it, uh, you're not able to really construct it. And then it just traveled around the room. And so I would see these things happen on Twitter as well, right? You'd have um, some sort of task that was super pop, maybe a math mistake or a, um, a which one doesn't belong or an open middle type question. And it would just sort of become super popular very quickly and it would catch a lot of attention. And so this sort of visibility um, aspect is one place that I think the mobi mobility of knowledge is something that um, I see in both spaces. Another thing that um, I was really curious about was the moments of negotiation. So the moments where generativity of ideas comes in and like novel emergent material happens, which is really learning, right? Like, that's when students co-create a solution. And so because I was interested in that, I was seeing that in the workshops, in classrooms, I was curious how this was happening on Twitter. And there's, you know, I started digging into the places where negotiation was happening, which it wasn't very prevalent. It was less prevalent than I would expect. Um, Twitter is kind of a negotiation depleted space, but there were moments where somebody would post an example, I think there was a math mistake that I analyzed, um, posted by someone with you know a lot of followers, and so everyone saw it, and there were several threads that kind of kept going, and not only did they talk about the mistake, the math mistake, they started generating new materials and new activities and resources uh, that they could use with students um, for this mistake. And so what I noticed in those threads was the places where the negotiation really went on were the places where the two people talking, which usually it was two or three people conversing with each other, they had a lot of sort of shared experience when you look into them and like I knew about the community members and so they have a lot of sort of shared uh, redundancy. And so that allows them to communicate. Like you have that shared experience, so you're able to communicate. And then you layer on, they also had diverse perspectives on it. So the places where there was redundancy, they kind of got to a place and then stopped because there was no new diversity to keep them going. But the places where they were redundant and diverse in their thinking um, were places where new material would happen. Okay, so this idea, and this comes from complexity theory. Yes. And incidentally, that was, I think we wrote about that in that paper that we presented at PME mm -hmm. in Singapore, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, there is this idea of redundancy and diversity was then ported into thinking classrooms as a way to understand why groups of three seem to be optimal. Mm -hmm. Because again, this was like, even before I met Judy, this was one of the results that had uh, emerged strongly in the in the research was that in intermediate to high school level kids and beyond uh, groups of three seem to be optimal um, groups of four there was always a devolution of, yeah. of sort of a group of four always devolved into mm -hmm. a group of three plus one groups of five just wasn't working groups of two were okay sometimes but sometimes they weren't and um, this realization this idea coming from Twitter around these new threads and seeing where negotiation was working revealed this idea that redundancy and diversity was both important and when we started looking at that in the in the groupings we realized that this is probably what explains why groups of three was optimal because groups of three has a nice amount of diversity while you're still able to maintain redundancy if the groups get too large mm -hmm the likelihood that you have a common redundancy gets smaller, um, although you get increased diversity. And if the groups get too small, you have a heightened ability to 
produce redundancy, but you have less diversity. And groups of three seem to produce that perfect balance. And then, of course, it was a social layer that came with too yeah. many kids in a group. But there's a nice example of how um, an idea that you saw in Twitter, mm -hmm. something that was happening in MitBoss, was able to be theorized and ported over to Thinking Classroom. Mm -hmm. As you were introducing that, you talked about this common experience as a way to build redundancy. And that was something else that was something that traveled between these two contexts. Can you say a little bit more about orienting experience or common experience? Sorry. Yes. With, with redundancy and diversity, um, like I saw in the threads, you needed enough redundancy between the agents. Um, and so that would happen through personal interactions and things like that on Twitter. In the thinking classroom, however, it's already built into the structure. So you're starting with um, an orienting experience that is common to everyone, um, and it's synchronous, so they are all there at the same time. They're experiencing um, that same opening of a task or whatever it is that you're beginning with, and I believe that that is serving as sort of the redundancy-orienting moment. So and, and then that's when the, the diversity is... I think that too often we... Um, assume that students don't know enough or we try to preload them, but they actually have a lot of diversity. It just doesn't get, doesn't get unleashed right. in a way that's safe for them to unleash. So, so this kind of makes, makes sense of, so one of the results that came out of Thinking Classrooms was that that first thinking task has to happen within the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and there was lots of reasons for that. One was that it's harder to get students to go from a passive sort of receiver of knowledge to an active generator of knowledge. Um, it was also difficult for teachers to hold back. Mm -hmm. If they knew a task was coming yeah. later in the lesson, they, there was this tendency to pre-teach it. Yeah. But this also explains why it's so important to have that task early on, because that creates that redundancy, mm -hmm. that orienting experience that produces a redundancy for the students so that they can start working and bring their diversity to bear. Yeah. And I think Along with what you said that too often we assume that students um, don't have diversity. We also too often assume that students have redundancy. Yeah, we do. And we assume that if we just get students going on something. That, that they'll remember a past concept. Right. Or we just, yeah. Yeah. And which is why in thinking classrooms, it's so important that that first task is something that they all experience together. Mm -hmm. It could be the introduction of the task. It could be the way the task is modeled. Or it could be just the first task that they work at. And they but can that, all access it. Right. But yeah. that first task is not what the goal of the, of the lesson yeah. is. The goal of the lesson is to get well beyond that first yeah. task. But that first task orients mm -hmm. the students, creates that redundancy it, so that yeah, they can Yeah, and if it's launch. not accessible enough, then you're, you're robbing them of that redundancy. So then they can't right. really go off of that when they're in their groups. The other thing I think is really important here is the, just the safety of the small groups that are sort of... Um, in this private space it's public enough for you to see it but it's private that it feels safe and so because they feel safe they're more likely to to share their diversities which is actually a form of vulnerability for them okay so and I know there was something else about that because somewhere along the line I remember when we were you were digging into Mitboss, you found that the the tweets that sort of catch fire those mm -hmm. those tweets that people put out that really seemed to generate a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. There was sort of some common elements to that. Yeah. Um, pride, accomplishment, uh, vulnerability, curiosity, novelty, and just like a willingness to be open to ideas. And, and those were the tweets that really, really caught on um, in terms of not just what was in the tweet, but how it was framed and how it was phrased and how personally vulnerable uh, people made themselves. Right. And so, so this is a huge hallmark of Thinking Classrooms is the ability for that space to create room for students to be curious mm -hmm. and vulnerable and feel safe being vulnerable yeah. and safe offering ideas. And they're small groups of three, even though it is a public forum, but within that micro space, they, mm -hmm. they do feel safe. It, um, it also, I, and I, I'm only now realizing this, is that, so a huge part of consolidation in a thinking classroom mm 
is this idea that we don't ever, the research very quickly showed that you don't ever let students present their own work. Mm -hmm. And this rubs against a lot of contemporary practices. But what we were finding was that when students were presenting their own work in consolidation, nobody was listening. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, if I asked the class to think about what a group had been doing on a board and, and conjecture what that group was thinking, we had everybody was much more dialed yeah, in. Someone than, and, not from this group explained what... Right. That was a, can someone not in this group yeah. please tell us what's going on here? Such a good move. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I... And I've characterized this because this kept coming out in the research over and over again, the difference between what I call tentative knowledge and absolute knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the idea that tentative knowledge is open. Mm -hmm. it, it still leaves room for people to, to add on, to add mm -hmm. their own thoughts. It's a conjecture, not a statement of fact. Yeah. And what you were saying there about that the tweets that caught fire were the ones that were tentative were tentative yeah, yeah. and opened up space mm -hmm. for people to add things. And, you, and I agree with you. When I look at mm -hmm. Twitter, the people who make statements, those tweets don't mm -hmm. catch fire in the same way that tweets that ask a question, mm -hmm. leave room. Yeah. For people to, yeah, to or contribute. Com or commiserate, like just share yes. emotions. Yeah. Sometimes that. So that vulnerability, mm -hmm. tentative knowledge crossover between mm -hmm. mid-boss and thinking-boss. Well, and Boston. if you think of mathematics and school mathematics, it's not usually presumed to be tentative. It's usually presumed to be final, finalized. And so I think this is why students in a thinking classroom end up leaving wondering if they were doing math at all you know like that I get that comment all the time it didn't feel like we were doing math right um, and I've heard this from were. lots of teachers too yeah. teachers who launch at the beginning of the school year with thinking classrooms and like three weeks later students are asking so when yeah. are we going to start doing math yeah. yeah yeah so you you mentioned this idea that math isn't classically seen as something that's tentative math as the body of knowledge is mm -hmm. absolute, but our job as educators, it's, it's sort of under debate right now, what is our job? In BC, the curriculum has been split into uh, competencies and content, and the way I characterized that on Making Math Moments episode 21 was the difference between a verb and a noun. So mm -hmm. competencies are the verb, the, the generalizing, the, the rationalizing, mm -hmm. the reasoning, the um, the visualizing, the in words, the mm -hmm. verbs, whereas yeah. the content is the noun of mathematics, the, uh, the, the cosine law, the sine law, yeah. the trig identity, the, Pythagorean. Yeah. these sorts of established knowledge. But, and, and I guess the debate as to what it is our job as math educators is, is it our job to put absolute knowledge into the heads mm -hmm. of students or, or is it our job to, have students engage in the process mm -hmm. of meaning making. Mm -hmm. So is math education about meaning making, which could be characterized as tentative, or is it about the meaning made, yeah. which is the noun, the, mm -hmm. the content? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something to think about. And really starting with the meaning making, like I, I did that um, Ignite talk at um, the Northwest Conference yes. about meaning making and meaning made and I really tried to bring home this idea of who are we giving power to who's whose ideas are we giving power to right um, and so by starting with meaning making you're engaging the learners and you're allowing them to feel part of this meaning making that it is a tentative space that they have control over it and then when you consolidate you're building the meaning made out of their ideas. Right. So it's no longer some, you know, ancient mathematician's meaning made that they're learning about. It's their meaning that has been made. And this is so important in the consolidation to make use of the student's work because otherwise the message we're sending is, I want you to think about this for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then let's just I'm forget just about... i tell you. Yeah, forget <laughs> about everything you just did. This is yeah. how it's supposed to be done. Yeah. 
And, and that's not what it's about. In a thinking classroom, it's the thinking that's important and we're trying to value the thinking and we're trying to value the products of the thinking. And the people who are doing and the And the people who are doing the mm-hmm. thinking. Um, and consolidation is such a delicate dance around that idea. Well, in Twitter, the people were really important as well. Yes. So on Twitter, you have a tweet and it, ha- not, it has the idea and then it has the person who made the idea. Yeah. And what I found in digging through tweets over tweets and there was this social layer that was underlying all of the meaning making that was happening and I think that really comes into the thinking classroom as well so what I found in Twitter was that the ideas that caught on were made by people who generally would show social responsibility towards others they would be giving with their ideas they would care about other people's ideas but they were also focused on the same sort of content space, the idea space that everyone was in. And so if you port that into a thinking classroom, it makes sense. Like you can watch a thinking classroom and you see that the classrooms where you have um, students who care about each other and are socially responsible to help each other out, they'll go to another group and sort of help them out or um, be giving with their ideas. That really builds that social glue and that social culture that can make a greater effect, I think, in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And I think you've seen that. Oh, yeah. Um, so do you want to tell that story about the, the, the two classrooms you were in that were the same but different? Right. So this, I think this, this is one where we're referring to where we taught the same lesson all day in different classrooms. Mm-hmm. So the lesson was where we're trying to calculate the area of compound shapes. So it was, you know, like a rectangle and a corner's cut off it and there's a semicircle carved out of it and then there's a little triangular hat. So it's a complex shape and you've got to figure out the area by adding areas and subtracting areas and so on and so forth. And all the teachers had sort of agreed to give this sequence of tasks to their grade nine students. And in the first class we went into... Uh, one of the things that I observed, I was watching two groups, was that these two groups stood with their hand up idle for about two thirds of the lesson. So, and their hands were up either because they were done and they were waiting for the teacher to give them the next task, or they were, they, they had a question, they were stuck. And, and the teacher was working her way around the room and it was taking her about eight minutes to get around the room and answer questions and give extensions mm-hmm. to the next task and so on and so forth. So that's sort of what we observed in the first class. We went into the second class and this different teacher teaching his grade nine students now, um, same sequence of tasks. And I was observing two groups and, and not only did neither of those two groups put up their hand at all during the entire lesson, no group put up their hand. Mm-hmm. And they got through way more tasks. And when we started to unpack what was going on here, the big difference was Uh, It really came down to mobility of knowledge, which is what you raised earlier, but it came down to this idea that um, in the second class, every time a group was done, they would go steal a task from another group in the room. Mm -hmm. And this is what we want happening in a thinking classroom. Yeah, and it's not just autonomy in in general, it's a very particular autonomy. Mm -hmm. It's the autonomy that when they are done, they are to go and find a way to extend their thinking Mm -hmm. by getting another task. And they can do that either passively or actively. So Mm -hmm. passively, they can just look around the room Mm -hmm. and see what someone else, or actively, they can go talk to another group. Likewise, if they're stuck, we want them to have the autonomy to to get a hint from another group. And again, they can do that passively by looking around or actively by going and talking to another group. And that was really alive in that second classroom. Mm -hmm. And in the first classroom, that wasn't alive at all. Mm And when I interviewed the teachers and we dug deeper to find out how one teacher had been able to bring that to life and the other teacher hadn't, it came down to really um, the way they were, first of all, ironically, it didn't have anything to do with giving the autonomy because both mm-hmm. teachers said that they had given their students freedom right, it's to available. do Right, it's available. There's yeah. opportunities there. And, and they had both declared that, like on multiple times they had told their class that's allowed. But what the second teacher had done that had brought this to life was that he had himself um, sort of forced this to happen. So when a group put up their hand early on and asked him to tell them what the next question was, he would direct them to a group that had mm-hmm. the next question. And if he, a 
group put up their hand because they needed a hint or they needed help, he would direct them to a group that needed, that could help them. So it was this sort of, you know, it's been said on Twitter, it's been said in lots of places, never answer a question that someone else in the room can. Mm -hmm. So it was about redirecting and redistributing that authority within the room mm -hmm. and, and mobilizing that very particular type of autonomy. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so we've talked now about the similarities uh, between the context of MITBOSS and thinking classrooms in a face-to-face -face environment and how seemingly different they are, how one informed the other and how, as I'm doing research in the thinking classroom and seeing these results, the things that were happening on MITBOSS were allowing me and you to see different things happening mm -hmm. in thinking classroom. They were, it was providing a lens for us to look through. Mm -hmm. And that was the good old days. Yeah. Back in February, <laughs> before uh, COVID-19 ravaged the world in general, and education in particular, yeah. and pushed all of us into this sort of online teaching. So we're going to talk about online teaching as a context now. And, um, and we're going to talk about how shifting to online helped us to see what was happening in the face-to-face -face environment. Mm -hmm. But before that, let's talk a little bit about your online teaching mm -hmm. because you were actively teaching in yeah, March. Yeah, and a lot of courses. And, and all of a sudden, as did I, but mm -hmm. let's talk about yeah, you. <laughs> uh, the, the lockdown came, you were midterm and all your classes were forced from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Yeah. And what were some of your experiences with that? So at that time, I had a, a few different courses. One of them was actually in a Math for Elementary Teachers course. Mm -hmm. And there was so much synergy happening in, in, the, in the course um, when students were working together, seeing other people's solutions, the thinking classroom was strong, the, they would walk in and they were such a strong community. Um, and so the lockdown came and we went online and I tried my best to reproduce the, the elements of a thinking classroom in an online space. So I had, um, you know, a zoom platform and then they'd break out into groups. Like we'd still do problems and they'd break out into the breakout rooms with the use of jam boards as sort of a whiteboard space. And then, you know, we tried to consolidate, but it was patchy. <laughs> to say the least. And, you know, I surveyed my students afterwards to, to understand how that shift was for them. And, you know, many of them actually, it was a hard time for everyone as well. So that transition period was hard. Um, many of them said that they just, they lost interest in, in the course and in engaging. And they found that there was a great sort of gap in, in their experience of of it and of course they said oh it was you know it was fine we managed but it just wasn't the same and some of the things they said that weren't the same were opportunities to be able to see what others are doing um, passively passively yeah. which was interesting and then also some of the students told me about how they would come to class and they depended on the class to create the social connections that they depended on for their learning mm. Um, but they didn't make those connections actively outside of class. Whereas some others would tell me that they even had like little backlog chats with their friends and that dissipated as well because they weren't regularly meeting in that space. So it was almost as if that, that regular physical meeting space had so much more to offer them in terms of uh, their sort of willingness to engage Right. Now that shifted in the fall. Well, when hold we on. Started. Be before we go yeah. into the fall, mm -hmm. what did did the students comment about anything that they had taken for granted in the face-to-face -face thinking classroom mm -hmm. that they hadn't really been themselves aware? Just like you and I are talking about how we're becoming more aware of some of the elements of thinking classrooms by looking at different contexts. Mm -hmm. Did the students become more aware of some of the elements of thinking classrooms? Uh, when they lost it and had to go into an online Yeah, program. actually, I, 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 had, I was just reading through the comments of the, the other night, and one of them said exactly that the, the opportunity to look at other people's work um, passively was something that she didn't realize she needed as much as 
because when you're in a Zoom breakout room, you can't really see what other people are. On the Jamboard, you can kind of, but it's just not as easy to passively look over your shoulder and see what someone else is doing. Right. And Mike Pruner and I have actually yeah. just written an article about this, mm-hmm. about the way ideas move around the room mm-hmm. in a thinking classroom, in a face-to-face thinking classroom, and how, um, how, how this idea of it being passive, being able to passively look when you're when the resources of a group runs out, mm-hmm. to be able to passively look and get an idea and bring it back to the group, and how mm-hmm. that keeps a group moving. Yeah. Yeah. The pace is yeah. stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other comments from students? Um, yeah, other, other comments were more sort of affective in nature, like their emotions, and they just didn't feel as engaged or supported um, by others. I think that element of community they depended on, even though they didn't realize it, they kind of took it for granted, especially my um, sort of adult basic education um, students who come and upgrade their math and they're quite vulnerable in general and so they would really depend on that space to support themselves socially it was almost like math just became the backdrop of what they were doing to connect socially yeah through and i think this is one of the things that that mm-hmm. february and march really taught us about yeah. thinking classrooms was that like the social was a was a the social space is a is an important dynamic in the yeah. thinking classroom and and being able to collaborate as a medium of meaning making Mm -hmm. but i think what we really learned there was this idea that the social and the and the cognitive are much more intertwined co-acting is a term you always say and then than we had first thought Mm -hmm. that it's that that social layer isn't just a byproduct of collaborating on math Mm -hmm. it's actually a a really really important part of it and if for some of your students it's almost like the math was a byproduct of the yeah, collaboration I mean, they, they no the longer social. had opportunities to say show how proud they were of something yeah. just to their friend without having to wait for everyone to listen right like yeah. it's just those opportunities for them yeah the pride and the accomplishment the vulnerability all of those things that make things catch on are so yeah. much harder um, to see in an online space so I had the same experience as mm-hmm. you where I was teaching I was nine weeks deep into a 13 week term and then the lockdown came. So I only had to do three weeks after. And I very much like you did, I tried to patchwork it together. And and, uh, although I think you did a better job, but I tried to, I experimented with a lot of different mediums and platforms to see what would happen. But then I didn't have to teach after that. Mm -hmm. But you taught in the fall. In the fall, yes. And so, so yeah, in the fall I had uh, a really strong group of uh, future secondary math teachers um, in a teacher education program and because they didn't start with the physical face-to-face experience and, and kind of see the loss of that happen they just started in the online space um, I felt like I was able to recreate a lot of it mm-hmm. in that in that with that group in particular um, they really engaged on the whiteboards they were good with using the digital tools. They were expecting to be in an online space. So the synergy was there. And I think, you know, they were able by the end of it to talk about all the elements of thinking classrooms that they might want to implement in the future. And they were sort of reflecting on what that would look like, even though they've never been in one physically. So videos helped with that, but, yeah, it was really cool to see. It was um, encouraging that you know it is possible. Right, and did you have so one of the things that I've been working on to try to so one of the things that we learned from from this shift to online was the loss of the yeah. passive. Yeah, and how it became so important that that being able to passively look over at another group's work was really instrumental, and we talked about that. And how that was sort of lost. And you're right. On Jamboard, we can kind of, we, yeah. they can kind of flip to another page and look what's on They don't offer to do it. Like no. They have to actively click on the button right. to go look at someone else's work. And, and one of the things that that raised for us was this idea that, whereas in the thinking classroom, in the face-to-face, good old days, February yeah. world, um, we talked about passive or active. 
interaction. Yeah. And one of the things that this has led us to start to talk about is that that it's not passive or active. It's passive then active. Mm-hmm. And this idea that like those two grade nine classrooms that we talked about, the if I think back on this data now, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I would see that before an active interaction, there was a passive interaction. Mm-hmm. So like passive is the first swipe. And then if passive leads to something interesting or partially interesting, but not enough, upon. then it gets acted upon. And then there's an interaction between the two groups. So this idea that they look across and see that that group has a different answer. That's a passive. Then there's a discussion. Then there's an active interaction with that group. Mm-hmm. Um, and because passive was gone in the online environment, active was still there mm-hmm. in the spaces that you created, but it wasn't being acted on. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been playing with to try to bring the passive mm-hmm. back the knowledge feed. is the knowledge feed. Yeah. Which is, and that's worked really well, too, because yeah. you shared it with me and I tried it and... It was great. It was nice for consolidation. So maybe tell us more about what that is. Okay. So the knowledge feed is this idea that, um, sure, we could set them all up into different Zoom rooms, for example, if Zoom is a platform we're using, but they can't move from room to room to talk to each other. We can create a Jamboard, which is where they can go and and have a a shared workspace. Mm -hmm. And if people happen to be in the same Jamboard, they can look at each other's boards. But... What those are missing is that ability to just glance to the side. So I thought, how can that be recreated in this space? So what I did was I created, uh, I used Google Doc. So I just created a Google Doc and it's open on the page alongside uh, whatever collaborative platform you're using. So it doesn't matter which one you're using. And it's just a Google Doc that starts empty. Mm -hmm. And I call it a knowledge feed. And it's from the idea of a Twitter feed. So a Twitter feed is just scrolling constantly. Yeah. And the knowledge feed is scrolling too. Allows for neighbor interactions to happen. Mm -hmm. So the idea is so that I give a task and then when they're out working, I can put that task on the knowledge feed. I can put extensions to that task on the knowledge feed. You can put people's work on the knowledge feed. I can cut and paste a student, a group's work on there. Or insert some work. Like I was doing that one, the split 25 question, and I just sort of snuck in decimals and pointed to it later and and it just worked beautifully. So you could add hints and you can color code this if you want, where the hints and extensions are going to be one color. Student work can be a different color, but you can actually cut and paste. And the idea is that the students also start. And this was happening in one of the workshops I led previously was mm. that the, the people who were working were looking at the knowledge feed, seeing that I was posing questions, giving hints. And all of a sudden you start to see images from hmm. their work appearing they in this feed. It. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, it's in many ways it's non-linear like it's linear in a way but temporally it's non-linear they're pacing this stuff forever and it's scrolling and but anybody who's in this regardless of what work uh zoom room they're in is seeing this knowledge feed and they're able to pick up on things occasionally it's kind of like they don't have to choose who's bored to look at right it's already sort of the authority has sort of made it a place that they trust yeah and, and, and there's anonymity in the pasting. Yeah. Like, sure, you could yeah. probably backtrace it if you wanted to, but it's all of a sudden things appear and they're yeah. there. And it's to create that sort of passive space. Mm-hmm. And I found it works really well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, it really worked well. And then you use it for, con- it's so much easier to use for consolidation right. as well. Right. Because the cons- yeah. you're not, you only have to screen share you one screen <laughs> yeah, you're and then you're scrolling back around. and forth. And it's yeah. so this idea of the knowledge feed is something that is is an online version of trying to create that passive interaction mm-hmm. that became so important. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, the next stage is going to be how do we get people to move from the passive on the knowledge feed to the active, active. of interacting with yeah. another group? Only time will tell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so let's talk about one last thing here. Mm-hmm. In this evolving world, you and I had a common experience recently Mm -hmm. where we were co-leading a a professional development day. Uh, It was a face-to-face day. With masks. Masks and social distancing. Yeah. And uh, and so as much as possible, we were trying to recreate a typical good old-fashioned thinking classroom workshop. Mm -hmm. But there was these elephants in the room, right? There was... 
Everyone in the room had a mask on. There was social distancing protocols put in place. But we still were able to have them work collaboratively at Whiteboard. Yeah. But there was, there was some things in the room that happened differently. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what yeah, was so different? The first thing that struck me, and then we talked more about it and things emerged, but the first thing that struck me was that everything just seemed slower. Yeah. Right? Like it just seemed like the energy levels were slower than a typical session that I would come to, but it still sort of achieved the goals. Um, in, I'd say it's probably better than a Zoom session in so many ways, but when you compare it to the good old days, there was that energy was lacking. I think what we ended up talking about with that is, is the distance, the proximity, the physical proximity between groups. And we noticed that there was very little um, passive or active for that matter. Not, not even really any passive um, interaction of moving uh, from group to group. Right. And yeah. so we should say that the protocol that was in place was the groups were preformed. Yes, there so, was also that. So they weren't yeah. random groups, but they were in their school clusters. Mm -hmm. So they were, and the room was big enough that they could stay two meters apart from each other. Yeah. yeah, they could stay two meters apart from each other, even within their group, although they didn't. Yeah. But the groups were far apart from each other. Yeah. And you're right, the task moved slower, but there was this energy and we, we attribute it to proximity. Now, mm -hmm. where proximity had appeared in Thinking Classrooms previously was what we had discovered was when the groups, mm -hmm. so let's say we have a class, a Thinking Classroom, and we make 10 groups of three and we get them all vertical mm -hmm. and we're trying to hack our room as much as possible and we end up with three groups on this wall and four groups on that wall like one in the and corner. two on that <laughs> wall and then one in the corner. <laughs> and one of the things we've always noticed was that the one group in the corner often lagged. Yeah. Um, and we just thought, okay, that was just that group. Right. Eventually I started to figure out that yeah. proximity mattered and this passive mobility of knowledge mm -hmm was really important and this idea was that and we also saw this when I would do workshops in these massive spaces where we'd have yeah. everyone on one wall yeah. the groups at the end yeah always had a tougher time than the groups that were in the middle and it had I suspect it has to do with how much knowledge is around them and how well that knowledge can move and if you're on the end or an island you don't have that knowledge impinging or, or mm -hmm. infringing on your space all the time that allows for the groups to move forward. So here we had these groups so far apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So there was less knowledge mobility, but it wasn't just that. Because in a thinking classroom, there are several moments where students stand together in close proximity. When a task is introduced, we have found that students standing in close proximity to the teacher, standing and in close proximity mm -hmm. for the introduction of the task, is much more effective than having them sitting in their desk mm -hmm. or even off at their boards to begin yeah. with. Also during the consolidation, we have found that having the students standing in close proximity to the teacher while the teacher's leading this gallery walk um, was much more effective than putting the students back into the desk. So this sort of standing maintains, uh, affords less anonymity for the students because mm -hmm. that was one of the things we found in thinking classrooms. Mm -hmm was that sitting produced anonymity and anonymity produced disengagement. But having them stand removed the anonymity, but that close proximity seemed to be important now too, because in this workshop, yes, they stood for the introduction of the problem, but they were far apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And they stood for the consolidation as we did the gallery walk, but again, they were far apart from each other. And it led to much less of what I would call this piling on, yeah. where one, one participant will offer an idea and another will pile on to yeah. it, and another will pile on, and another will pile and on. And the excitement levels. Yeah. Too, like the In psychology, they call it burstiness. Mm. So burstiness <laughs> is this idea that this, this piling on of ideas. Yeah. And there definitely was less of that in that space. Yeah. And again, here we go, a new context revealing more things about thinking classrooms. Yeah, things that we would have taken for granted or not right. seen as. So I knew that standing was yeah. important. I, and we always, but we didn't know how much the proximity was mm -hmm. important. And again, I don't know why. Well, we've also talked about the, the opportunity for expressing emotions with each other uh -huh, as yes. well. 
so the emoting. Um, yes. When they are in close proximity, there there is sometimes that energy or synergy that comes from those sort of um, offhand remarks that someone makes or you know a smile that someone yeah. or laughs. Um, and when you have your mask on and, and you're far apart from the others and you can't hear the excitement of the others necessarily, like there's le- less of that sort of bubbliness. Right. right. And and what was interesting to watch was that that actually affected the speed at which they move through the task. So the emotions so, <laughs> need proximity yeah. to propagate. Yeah. And the emotions is what builds the energy and the excitement in the room. So now that we're in this world, <laughs> I mean, now we just have are able to learn about about the good old days. But I think, you know, there was still a lot of positives from that session. That oh, yeah. Really it was a great session. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. like, from my perspective, it was yeah. a very good session. Yeah, no, I thought and uh, from what we've heard mm-hmm. it was well received and so on yeah. um okay so all these shifting contexts are revealing more and more and more and i think this is true in general if we pay mm-hmm. attention to it it's um in math education uh dan Chazen and patricio herbs talk about breach experiments mm-hmm. so breach experiments are these ideas that this idea that Sometimes it's really hard to articulate what we do and why we do things. Mm -hmm. And it's not until there's a breach in the didactic contract, until we have, we see something happen incorrectly Mm -hmm. that we are able to tell why that was not the way it should be and what would have been better. And I think that what COVID-19 and before that Mick Boss offered us was a series of breaches that, that drew attention to things in thinking classroom so for example in a thinking and we've talked about this the 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 idea that standing was important came out of the data Mm -hmm. proximity was important didn't come out of the data it just standing and proximity seem to always go together Mm -hmm. but the proximity seems to be coming through in this breach Yeah. yeah yeah so i wonder what we'll talk about next year yeah Depends on what breach experiments happen. That's right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Good.